Hey, Dr. Berg here. In this video, we're going to talk about blood sugars. Okay? Very, very, very important, yet very misunderstood. Uh, if you have diabetes, if you have hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, if you're concerned about preventing those, you want to watch this video. Now, here's how it works. The law of the body is that no matter what, the body must maintain a certain level of sugar in the blood. Okay, so the blood sugar level, we'll call it glucose level, should always be right around 100. Now, if you want to know the um, units, I think it's milligrams per deciliter, but don't worry about that. But there's blood testing units that you can test your blood, and it should be right here. Now, it does range between 80 and 110, but if that blood sugar goes too high, Okay, that's called hyperglycemia. That means that's diabetes. Okay, if the blood sugar is too low, that is called hypoglycemia. Okay, so the goal for the body is to maintain a blood sugar of 100. So it'll do everything, it'll tear the body apart, it'll turn, it'll break down your muscle protein with one goal is to maintain normal blood sugar. So everything that, almost everything you eat uh, eventually breaks down into glucose or sugar, okay? Even foods that are not sugar, even protein and fat will break down and then you're gonna build it, the body will build it back up into sugar. So sugar is used for fuel and nourishment to the cells. So the way it works is this. You have this huge organ here called the liver. The liver is on the right side of your body. It's about three and a half pounds, the size of a football. And then we have this tiny organ right here, which is called the pancreas. And that's right, right here, on the, right below the left rib cage. Now, these two organs reciprocate. And what I mean by that is they, they have a mutual relationship. They coordinate. Uh, they kind of um, control the blood sugars, okay? But the liver is the most ignored piece of the puzzle in diabetes, which we'll get into, um, simply because here's how it works. The liver controls blood sugar when you're not eating. And the pancreas controls blood sugars when you eat. All right, and they go back and forth and back and forth. So what the pancreas does is it makes a hormone, it's called insulin, and it uh, basically what it does is it gets the sugar out of the blood, okay, so it takes it out. It reduces blood sugar, okay, so there's hormones that lower that sugar, all right? That's when you're eating because you just ate and you're flooding the blood with sugar even if you don't eat sugar, because uh, everything turns on the sugar eventually. Now, when you're not eating, we need to kind of raise the sugar. So your liver will put sugar into the blood, okay? So it goes in, all right? So, and it does it through a hormone that's very similar to insulin, um, but it does the opposite, and they call that insulin-like growth factor. <laughs> So it's an insulin-like hormone, but IGF, it, don't even worry about that right now. Just realize there's a hormone that basically, and where it gets the sugar is it gets the sugar from two sources. One is the muscle and the liver, okay? And that, that's basically stored sugar, okay? So in other words, your body has stored sugar, and the word for that is glycogen. That's basically a bunch of sugars uh, that's stored in the body so you can use it fast, okay? And uh, it also gets it from fat, all right? So those are the two sources that you're tapping into. So obviously that's the goal is to be able to lose fat or tap into fat, but that's the purpose of fat is to act as a storage so you can use it when you're not eating, okay, or starving or exercising or fasting, those things. So the liver basically takes that fat and it converts it into sugar, and it puts all the sugar back in the blood to keep that 100. But first, it goes after the stored sugar. So this is number one, 
and this is number two. So in the presence of any stored sugar or any sugar at all, uh, this fat will not be used at all. The body does not like to burn fat in normal situations unless there's no sugar there, okay? So the way it works simply is the pancreas regulates sugar, it put, pulls sugar out when you're eating, and then when you're not eating, um, the liver starts kicking in there and puts the sugar back in and starts to take this storage and start to put it back in the blood to maintain a sugar at 100. Now let's talk about uh, briefly what happens when that sugar gets pulled out of the blood when insulin goes up. Okay, so there's three situations that occur. Number one, that energy, that sugar could be used as energy, immediate energy. Let's say you're exercising, so you're going to be using up your energy. Or during a marathon, the person's eating sugar and it's kind of burning up. Or number two, it's being stored as sugar. Uh, that's stored sugar in your liver and in the muscles. Um, so we want that to happen because um, if it's stored, then it's not converted to fat. Okay, so I'd rather have stored sugar than fat, right? Because stored sugar is just going to use for energy, but we don't want too much. So there's a certain amount of sugar that's stored in the body. But in order to store this sugar right here, what happens is that you need potassium, all right? Without potassium, you can't store sugar. So for every sugar, a little molecule, you need one potassium molecule like that. So potassium is like the glue to hold the sugar together. So with low potassium levels, the person will start craving sugar. Why? Because they can't store sugar. So they crave sugar. Why? Because the sugars are going down and the body's telling you, give me that sugar. So the symptom of cravings means your body has low blood sugar and it's really low potassium. So what, is hap what happens when people crave sugar? They go eat sugar, right? What they should consume is potassium. Now the problem that most people have is they don't really know how much potassium they need on a daily basis. An average body needs 4,700 milligrams. That's a lot. Uh, in fact, one banana is 400, so you'd have to have 10 bananas. That's not going to work. So we really need, our bodies need seven cups minimum of vegetable every single day. Now, if you're doing one cup or two cup, it's not going to cut it. And you're, if you're taking a pill, it's like 40 milligrams, you have to have like 100 of them. So we want to do the vegetable. So you can do the kale shake for breakfast as part of it, um, and then have your eggs, whatever, and then for lunch have this huge salad, for dinner have some more vegetable. But we really want to shoot for seven cups. And if you're at all interested in managing or improving your blood sugar issues, this is a must, especially if you have diabetes. Okay, so we want stored sugar. And then it also, if there's too much sugar to be pulling out, and that sugar's not being used as energy, and you don't have potassium, guess what? It goes right to fat. So it's being converted to fat. So that is one relationship between potassium and fat. If you don't consume enough vegetables or potassium, you tend to gain more fat. All right, so that's just, those are the three things that occur with where the sugar goes after you consume sugar and the spike of the hormone insulin from the pancreas. Now the next point has to do with what is diabetes. Diabetes uh, is a condition where your body has no longer um, been able to regulate the sugar in here. And it comes from consuming obviously too much sugar. That's the most common cause. Um, but here's the thing. Um, diabetes type 2 is a less serious diabetes. Type 1 is a more serious di type, uh, type of diabetes. So type 2 is really a problem with the liver um, because what happens is the, they take a drug called glucophage or another name for it, metformin, and what all that does is it makes the cells in the liver more receptive or receiving more insulin. So they work on the receptors in the liver, okay, receptors. So they increase the conductivity of insulin. So each receptor in the liver for insulin um, becomes magnified. And there's 200,000 receptors for insulin for every liver cell that you have. So if you can imagine really what diabetes type 2 is, it's insulin resistant, resistive, whatever you want to call it. 
So I guess the best analogy, let's say you had a bunch of telemarketing people call your house over and over and over every day for a year. You're not going to pick up anymore. Okay? You're not going to keep picking up every time they call. You're going to be a bit resistive to that communication. So that's what diabetes type 2 is, being very resist resistive to insulin. And then they take this drug called uh, glucophage, which basically makes it more, it picks up the phone a lot more. So then now we can receive that insulin communication and thus lowering the blood sugar. Okay? So the diabetes medication lowers the blood sugar. So usually because these diabetes, it's a high sugar state. And the problem is that if you ever have a low blood sugar and you take these medications, it's going to make it worse because you're going to go even for lower. So you don't want to take medication if it's too low or normal, only when it's too high. And the problem, when the blood sugar goes low, many times people are taking sugar pills, which basically make the problem worse because now you're going to spike the insulin too high. We're trying to avoid that situation. Now, type 1 diabetes is not a liver problem. It's a long-term chronic problem of the pancreas. And now the cells of the pancreas that make insulin are exhausted. And they pretty much just stop working. So thereby, therefore, no insulin is being produced. Therefore, the sugar goes higher and higher and higher and higher. And so then now they need insulin injections to lower the sugar. And they have to keep taking it through the day. They have time release and all sorts of things. So. Um, that is the difference between these two. Type 2 is the liver, type 1 is the pancreas problem. This is worse because now you don't make any insulin. Type 2, you do make insulin, but it doesn't work in the liver. So that's the relationship between the two. And then the real underlying cause, our bodies are not designed to consume 149 pounds of sugar per year. Our bodies are not designed to consume as much sugar as we're eating. I mean, even baby food is loaded with high fructose corn syrup. You have all this juice that the kids are fed and what we consume, the sodas and all that, we have way too much sugar. And the cells just are not designed to handle that and it puts it right into an exhaustive state. So you have a lot of people going right in diabetes, but you need to understand um, where the source is. And so the next part, I'm gonna show you some even deeper information on that little cycle. Okay, now check this out. We talked about the liver and the pancreas and the hormone in the liver and the hormone in the pancreas. What's fascinating is that this hormone is a hundred times bigger than insulin as far as quantity of hormone. In other words, the ratio is a hundred to one as far as the work that's done. The majority of work of establishing blood sugars is done by the liver, yet very few people emphasize the importance of the liver in maintaining blood sugars. It is this, one of the most important things to keep healthy when you're trying to establish blood sugars, simply because the quantity of work that the liver does is, is 100 times bigger than insulin. But everyone focuses on insulin. Now, why? Well, how did that happen? Why don't doctors know about this? Why don't they make this more available because if you, and I found this, I looked at the units that they measure this hormone in the liver, it's called IGF, the units that it's, are different than insulin. So in other words, they measure this hormone, what's called nanograms, and this hormone by micromoles. So they're completely apples and oranges. So you cannot see this 100 to 1 ratio. In other words, it's kind of like um, measuring uh, metric versus inches or uh, what is it, um, Celsius versus Fahrenheit, or um, gallons versus ounces. You ha when you're measuring two things that work together, they have to be the same units. And if they're not the same units, you're going to miss the fact that this liver is a hundred times more important than the pancreas ever was. Now, how, what's the significance of that? How can we use that information? Well, all we have to do, simply, if we want to improve the function of the blood sugars and uh, correct diabetic conditions is increase the liver. If you just increase the liver by 20%, you basically, you take 80% of the stress away from the pancreas. You, you create a tremendous relief on that blood sugars. And so the, remember, the insulin cells that are actually exhausted are overworking because of all the sugar coming in there. So what we're trying to do is reduce the stress on that cell 
to salvage that. So the significance is all you have to do is improve the liver by a little bit to take a lot of pressure off this pancreas here simply because this is where this needs to do its lion's share. And so that leads to what most people have is liver damage, but it won't show up on a blood test till later in life. So when you damage a liver by consuming too much alcohol or too much cooked foods or junk foods or even not enough vegetables because the, the way to repair the liver is through raw vegetables and that is why I start everyone out on the liver enhancement in my book, Chapter 10, because if you improve the liver function, you actually can help a lot of different problems. Also, age. Every decade you get older um, and you reach the age of 50, you lower this hormone called growth hormone. Now, uh, some of you have heard that the relationship between growth hormone and anti-aging. Well, growth hormone is, is a major um, trigger for the liver to release this hormone right here that regulates blood sugars. So really, IGF, insulin-like growth factor, is an extension of growth hormone. They're both almost identical in function. So growth hormone does a lot for regulating blood sugars. So we want to keep this high. And so let's say you're not eating a lot of sugar. Well, it could be that you're just getting older to the fact that the liver is not receiving that growth hormone as much. So there are things you can do to improve it. But the fact that is the growth hormone that goes down, you have to be even better on your diet because you don't have the full capacity of that regulation of that liver function. See, growth hormone does three things. It burns fat because it really mobilizes fat for the blood sugars. It also helps you, um, it's anti-aging, and it, it's, um, it protects your proteins. So it's called a protein spare hormone. And what that means is that it prevents your protein from turning, breaking down into sugar and use for fuel. Okay, so it protects your protein. What protein? Collagen. So you, you avoid getting this, loose skin, sagging belly, all that. And also it protects your cartilage and collagen in your knees and your shoulders and these other joints. So it's a very important thing in protecting muscle protein breakdown that's occurring from the cortisol from the stress. Remember that cortisol hormone, which is very destructive on your cells when you go through a lot of stress, that will break down your muscle protein, especially in your thigh muscle and your legs. That's why you can't get your thigh muscles toned because you have too much of this darn destructive cortisol and not enough of that. So we're trying to reverse this um, process. So how do we do it? Number one, um, intense exercise is very good, but that would be interval training. Very important to keep growth hormone up. And I'm talking like short little tiny workouts, maybe 30 seconds, resting for three minutes back and forth every other day versus the treadmill. That will actually enhance growth hormone unless you're really, really stressed and you're not sleeping, you're going to have to walk. But eventually you want to work up to interval training, okay? And then number two, sleeping. You need to sleep seven, eight hours to keep this growth hormone really high. And then the next thing is you need to get your liver healthy. You need to do the liver enhancement. You need to really protect your liver and improve it. And so what are the foods that will improve the liver? My favorite is, you guessed it, kale. Everything comes back to that kale, doesn't it? We've talked about that in every single video, and kale is one of the superfoods to heal and protect your liver because the liver loves the bitter vegetables and it's low sugar and it has a lot of properties to restore liver function. And when you have that kale shake in the morning, the, the liver will improve and you'll get a lot of potassium and you'll get more growth hormone and you'll get less insulin and you'll crave less and you'll be able to maintain your age better and prevent the protein breakdown. And I've had lots of people uh, improve their blood sugars by taking kale. So um, I hope this video helped you understand some of the basics of blood sugars and apply this information and I'll see you in the next video.